achieved. Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Scott Johnson. And on this episode of the show, we're breaking down the upcoming UFC 185 event featuring Anthony Showtime Pettis defending his title against current title challenger, number one ranked contender, Rafael Dos Anjos. I'll be breaking down my five main card predictions for you on this episode of the show. All of my preliminary breakdowns and predictions will be available at kamikazeoverdrive.net. You can also head over there and check out the predictors on the panel. I also have... Uh, In the not-too-distant future, we'll have World Series of Fighting and Bellator predictions posted on my website as well if you're interested in checking those predictions out. The bet pack will be posted. I've won some money on each of the bet packs in recent memory. Uh, so, including the last one, which produced uh, 46 and having almost 47 units in winning. So, at, if you if you bet small and do 10 bucks a unit, that's 400 and almost 470 bucks. If you bet a bit bigger, maybe go 20 or 30 bucks, that's obviously a sizable return. And considering the number of units I invested over the whole card, it's a profitable night. And uh, overall, it was a pretty good night, despite the fact I went six and four. I lost a couple close split decisions early on. I did go four and one on the main card, so I'll take that. Uh, and we'll keep building. UFC 185 looks pretty solid. So make sure you check that out. And also I'm going to encourage you, the DraftKings competition. That was the new thing. You can click on the link and head over to DraftKings and play any number any uh, number of the competitions and tournaments they have available. But I would strongly suggest you to come out and challenge me in the Kamikaze Overdrive tournament. The, there's a number of banners on my website. Click on any of them. You can go through that banner and sign up there. We held the first contest uh, at USC 184, 20 competitors. I limited it to 20. We filled 20 and had a couple of emails for people trying to enter but couldn't because it was filled up. It's winner take all. It's $10 to enter. And the winner takes 180 bucks, obviously, because DraftKings takes a little bit for running the contest. And the winner last week was actually Mitchell Davies, who's one of my writers, one of my predictors. He took home 180 bucks with a very solid outing. Of the 20 competitors, I finished ninth. It didn't help that one of my lower picks, Roman Salazar, who I picked against him, but I sorry, I picked him to win, but he the, the fight didn't last very long because of the uh, no contest with the eye pokes. That took some points out. But all you have to do is go sign up, put your ten bucks in. You pick a team of five fighters based on the amount of uh, I believe it's five thousand dollars you're given to invest, and, uh, and then you pick your team of five fighters, and you watch them. They get points for significant strikes, uh, controlling on the mat, and of course winning the fight. A variety of other things, and you can follow along and see where you rank. And at the end of the night, if you win. You take home the prize. I've already got a couple people signed up for the current contest. I've opened it up to 25 people, so the first it's winner take all. So if you invest 10 bucks and you win, you're taking home a cool 225 bucks, which is pretty sizable. Plus, you know, if you beat me, it's a nice little coup, you know, thing you can hold over me, which isn't that difficult to do. Uh, nonetheless, I ramble for a little bit. We have five pretty awesome fights, so let's get to that first prediction. The opening fight on the pay-per-view takes place in the UFC's flyweight division. His former title challenger, number 10th ranked Chris Kamikaze, love it, Carriasso, 17-6-0 battles. Henry, the messenger, Cejudo, undefeated at seven wins and zero losses. Now, Carriasso is coming off a title fight loss versus Mighty Mouse. Was it a deserved title shot? Questionable. Uh... I would think it would be the climax of his career. Certainly looking at a title shot let down or title opportunity let down a lot of fighters experience after climbing the, to the precipice, coming up short, and then coming into that next matchup, realizing they got a long way to go and it can be difficult to rebound. He had won three fights in a row going into that matchup against lower-level competition, and I felt he earned the shot. As much as I like Chris Carriasso, he earned that title shot under the ideal circumstances with Mighty Mouse having beaten a number of the guys ranked ahead of him, a couple of injuries, including John Dodson's, preventing other guys from stepping in. So, you know, Carriasso got the opportunity, didn't, pan out so well, so it's time to start over. For Cejudo, he's attempting to make 125 pounds again, which can be very difficult. Most likely, almost definitely his last opportunity to make 125 pounds in the UFC. If he can't, he heads back to Bantamweight or possibly leaves the promotion altogether. He has a long history of struggling to make the weight. He had two 128-pound catchweight bouts in Legacy FC. He debuted, or was supposed to debut against Scotty Jorgensen as a flyweight, and that fight was cancelled because of health complications with him trying to cut down. And then he fought Dustin Kamor at 135 pounds, one, and they're giving him another opportunity because they realized he could pose a real threat to the champion and offer up a new title challenger if he can get things going. Now we're very, you know, Cejudo, he won the, uh, he won gold medals of both the 2008 Beijing Olympics and the Pan American uh, Games in freestyle wrestling at 55 kilograms. For Chris Carriasso, what he brings to the table, he's an 11 fight UFC veteran with a kickboxing Muay Thai background, so a very strong competitor. Uh, physically, Cejudo, one inch taller, one inch reach advantage. Uh, for Kamikaze, he has 12 wins by decision, 3 wins by knockout, and 2 wins by submission. He has 3 losses by submission on his records, which is notable against a guy who's a grappler. But Cejudo, as I said, undefeated, 3 wins by knockout, only a single submission win on his record, and 3 decisions overall. Looking at their strongest areas or where they would look to, like to compete mostly, you would think. Carriasso obviously wants to strike. Cejudo's strongest area is wrestling. 
But in his last matchup against Dustin Kimura, he was 0 for 2 in a takedown attempts. Really didn't show a lot of focus on looking to get the fight to the ground. And he wanted to prove, and he I certainly did, he's more than just a wrestler. We saw him drop Dustin Kimura with a well-timed right hand in that matchup. He showed excellent distance management, slipping just to the range of his opponent's op uh, attacks. And Kimura overall attempted 161 strikes, only landed 25. So it shows how effective his defense was. Now, the speed factor and of, of smaller opponents, the impact of the, of the cut on uh, Cejudo could be significant in this matchup if he struggles to make it, if he makes it at all, and that's something we have to keep into consideration here, and if this fight goes longer, that's another issue as well. But Carriasso, he's not known for being a super fast fighter, but he does have good cardio, and he has got a lot, got a lot of decision wins, so we know he can go the distance, so that's something he might look to take advantage of. We saw something similar against Jose Formiga, where he got beat up for the first two rounds, and then tried to rally late. Uh, what Carriasso does well, he's got a kick first attack, especially from the left side. Not a ton of power behind his hands, but his kicking game is strong. We did saw, see him take out Iliard Santos with the strikes on, on the feet, but still, that's not his you know his forte. You, you know, look for him to use a lot of kicks. The problem with Carriasso is he can become very predictable with his attack at, at, at times. As uh, you know, too much kicking. He does have a good exchange ratio, but against guys who can push the pace and shut down the kicking game, he becomes far less effective. He is capable of competing off his back if he's taken down, but he has had trouble with stronger gra grapplers. We've seen a number of fighters take him down multiple times. Um, Martinez took him down five times, Formiga four. Even Ilya Santos took him down twice in that short fight. And he spent a lot of time on his back against Formiga. After he got taken down, he could not get back up. He did endure, as I mentioned, tried to, to rally late, but to no avail. And if Suhudo, Suhudo is having trouble with cardio or in this matchup, and that's why, or the striking exchanges in general aren't looking good for him, I expect to see him changing levels and scoring takedowns with relative ease against Carriasso. But the weight cut, and as the weight cut and the impact of it, could be a major concern. But I think he'll be okay. I think this is, he'll be desperate to get down and make that weight cut and do a good job. Cejudo, you know, with a win, thrusts himself in the upper echelon of the division. I think he gets the job done here. So my prediction is Henry Cejudo to defeat Chris Carriasso. I'll take Cejudo by decision. Moving now to the UFC's heavyweight division, we've got number eight ranked Big Country Roy Nelson, 21-10-0, taking on number ninth ranked Thareem Alistair Overeem with a current record 38 wins, 14 losses, and one no contest. Now, both guys are looking to reclimb the ladder after setbacks and some struggles of late that have seen their title aspirations certainly be dampened. Overeem is coming off a win, but he's 2-3 and three in his last five fights. For Roy Nelson, he's 1-3 and three in his last four, and he's coming off the first real knockout of his career at the hands of Mark Hunt. Physically, as always the case, there's some disparities in the heavyweight division. Uh, Overeem is four inches taller and will have a massive eight inch reach advantage. The weight will be relatively close, but physically these are two entirely different human beings. I don't need to go into too many details there. Uh, both guys have massive knockout numbers. Overeem, 17 wins by knockout. Roy Nelson, 13 wins by knockout. But at the same time, their chins are vastly different. Nelson has been knocked out, as I mentioned, twice now in his career, while Alistair Overeem has been knocked out 11 times. So that's a big question. So, And there are a lot of questions coming in this matchup. Can Roy Nelson land that one big hitter-quitter, you know, put him to sleep? You know, can his chin, has his chin been cracked? That's another question. Roy Nelson's prided himself in his ability to take punishment and then deliver it. Did Mark Hunt start a trend that we see with a lot of guys who have good chins? You knock him out once and slowly it catches, it starts to catch up with him very quickly. Uh, for Overeem, you know, Will he be able to keep the distance and, and really outwork Roy Nelson? You know, how will his cardio hold up? You know, does he show continued growth from training at Jack Rag Jackson's and, and evolving as a fighter and taking some you know strides and, and improvements? Uh, when you compare them to strikers, Overeem is the far more diverse and capable striker. He comes from that kickboxing background. He throws a lot of really hard knees in the clinch. He's incredibly strong, controlling from top position or in the clinch. He's very difficult. He gets good body control. And he's very effective when he can fight at a pace that he can maintain, like he did against Frank Mir and like he did against Stefan Struve in that matchup. When he fought Ben Rothwell, he had really was having trouble getting cracked by Rothwell, uh, especially the uppercuts whenever he tried to engage when he threw kicks. And that's something he has to watch here is that counter strike that Nelson might look to uh, land. Overeem's going to have a big kicking advantage in this matchup. And Nelson doesn't throw a lot of kicks when he throws them. They're not overly effective. But again, as I mentioned, he needs to be careful to, to avoid being countered as, as Nelson's going to look for that opportunity to land that one big strike. Uh, statistically, uh, Overeem outlands Roy by about one and a half strikes per minute. And he gets hit on average 3.3 strikes per minute less than Roy Nelson. So if this fight goes the distance, which it very well could, 
even though a lot of people are predicting it's not going to. That's a big advantage for Alistair Overeem. For Roy Nelson, he has that big overhand right, and he's also very effective with the uppercut, which he knocked Matt Mitrione out with. Uh, he gets hit more than he gets uh, he hits, which is not great, especially if his chin is on the way out, which is a possibility. As I said, he relies on that one-hitter quitter that he's looking to poke some guy in the head with and knock him out. Uh, in his fight with Stipe Miocic, though, Miocic showed that he can't, if you can avoid getting cracked, especially early in that matchup, you can outmaneuver Roy, you can wear him out, and, you know, it's just very, it's the more diverse striker is going to win that fight. But lots of guys have attempted that and failed in that attempt. Um, with Roy Nelson, he has success when he closes the distance and swings, catches the opponent off guard, just comes forward and starts winging those big shots and looks to land one. When he fought Frank Mir, though, Frank Mir was able to tie him up in the clinch, land a lot of knees in close kicks, sneeze to the body at range as well, really busted him up to the midsection. That's something I can see over him doing with great eff efficiency. But with, where Roy is dangerous, it's Roy likes to try and throw strikes on the break. Chuck that big overhand right, kind of, again, swing wildly, but catch his opponent in the slight area of separation right when they might let their guard down because they think, okay, we're disengaging, and bam, Roy lands something significant. Uh, also, Mir had a lot of success in that matchup against Nelson, taking him down. And I think Overeem could look to employ something similar. I know Nelson's a black belt in BJJ, but Overeem's very strong. We saw him against Devin Struve. When he gets on top, he's devastating. Uh, since late 2008, Roy Nelson is 1-8 in, in fights that go outside of the first round. For Overeem, not the greatest numbers either. He's 5-6 and six in fights over his career in fights that last longer than five minutes. So certainly they managed Overeem, but not as much as we've seen in other matchups. For cardio, you know... Roy it is a problem. Overeem is pretty bad, but I think Alistair's cardio overall is a little bit better. If Roy can land like Ben Rothwell did, he could certainly take him out, and that's definitely a possibility. But the technique, the size, the length, the speed of Alistair Overeem are all advantages for him. The predictability and cardio of Roy Nelson will make it very unlikely that he wins this fight unless he lands something very early in the fight. And even though it's certainly an issue... With Overeem's chin, my prediction is Alistair Overeem to defeat Roy Nelson by decision, but don't rule out a knockout, especially later in that matchup, but I'll take Overeem by decision. Fight number three in the pay-per-view is another matchup, a fantastic fight. Again, people are holding their breath. These fights don't get canceled with a week to go. We're in the UFC's welterweight division. It's the number one contender and former welterweight champion, Johnny Big Rig Hendricks, 16-3-0. That was the number five ranked fighter in the division, Matt the Immortal Brown, with the current record of 21 wins and 12 defeats. Now, the winner of this matchup could very well be in line for the next shot at the title, certainly for Johnny Hendricks. Both guys are actually coming off losses against Robbie Lawler, uh, Brown losing before the title shot, and of course Hendricks losing the title to uh, ruthless Robbie Lawler. You know, and in that matchup with Brown, it was his real first big step up in competition. He's beat some noteworthy names, guys like Mike Pyle, Mike Swick, Eric Silva, Jordan Me, and Stephen Thompson, but certainly not high-level guys like Robbie Lawler, like Johnny Hendricks. For Hendricks, you know, he dropped that title in a contestable decision. He knows he needs a win to get back to that opportunity. Overall, he's been fighting at a much higher level than, than Brown, having fought Lawler twice, George St. Pierre, Carlos Kahn in his last four matchups. So it's a pretty impressive quartet of opponents there. Uh, physically, Brown will have three inches of height and a six-inch reach advantage. Certainly, the lower-ranked fighter with the physical advantages, but that doesn't usually equate to much. You have to back it up. Uh, big win totals. Hendricks, eight wins by knockout. He's 7-3 and three in fights that go the distance. For Matt Brown, he has 12 wins by knockout overall, and he has five wins by submission. Now, the big loss totals, certainly a concern here. Matt Brown has been submitted nine times in his career, but keep in mind, Johnny Hendricks has a single submission by, or single win by submission. He is a wrestler, but he's not really a massive submission threat, so I don't know if that plays into it. Again, watch Johnny Hendricks go and catch Matt Brown in a go-go plot. It's not going to happen, you know what I'm saying? Irony. Uh, stylistically, Hendricks is that wrestle boxer type. He likes to, you know, use his wrestling in reverse, mix it up with takedowns, but keep the fight where he wants it, and then use his boxing. For Brown, he's a Muay Thai striker, and I, I like to call him a volume grinder. He grinds and breaks guys down with his volume, and he has submission capabilities we already talked about, which could be interesting if he can hurt Johnny or wear him down. Uh, now, with Brown, he has the ability to push the pace and overwhelm his opponents. That's one of his strongest aspects of his game. And the big question is, with the weight-cutting issues Hendricks has had and the cardio issues, could Matt Brown wear him down quickly? Keep in mind, though, this is the first non-five-round fight for Johnny Hendricks in, well, since before, he, since he fought Carlos Conda, basically. So, you know, we've seen him fight three rounds, no problem, and I think you'll see him be able to come out and really attack. Uh, you know, Brown, very good in the clinch overall with his elbows and knee strikes, controlling an opponent in the tie plum, breaks him. That's one of his strongest areas to uh, you know, assault an opponent. The only problem is Hendricks is very good in that position as, as well. He uses some very nasty uppercuts, which he's very effective with. Hard knees to the thigh and head. Uh, I'm sorry, hard knees to the thigh, and he likes to head fight as well. And when all else fails, he's very quick at dropping down for a single leg and putting his opponent on the back. So he has a variety of weapons in that position here. Now keep in mind, we talked about the physical issues. Uh, Brown... 
His height's going to give him a leverage advantage if he can tie up Johnny and, and look for that tie plum. But also the height, will, his height advantage will work against him as it will allow Hendricks to drop and change levels easier to get in on his midsection on his legs and look for takedowns. So I actually give the advantage to Johnny Hendricks in the clinch, even though Brown is so effective in that position. At range, as I said, Brown has the reach advantage, but Hendricks is very good at fighting at very close range and staying in the pocket like he did against Robbie Lawler and trading and throwing. Hendricks is, you know, his takedown defense allows him to attack with really no fear of being taken down. He can do what he wants and he's, he's not going to be backed off by somebody threatening. That's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, one thing with Johnny, though, he hasn't showcased that offensive wrestling much lately. He did land five takedowns against Lawler, but it really wasn't a dominant aspect of that fight. Uh, you go back to the Carlos Condit matchup, which I think is kind of going to be similar to this one. He landed 12 takedowns, was very effective from with using his wrestling. I think he'll fall back on that a little bit here. Uh, when, against Kana in that fight, he threw three and four punch barrages, get his opponent covering up and change levels for takedowns, and I anticipate something similar in this fight as he looks to be a more diverse fighter and keep Brown guessing. But overall, Johnny Hendricks, he has shown exceptionally fluid and relaxed striking. He has a nice right jab, left hook combination. He throws a lot of low kicks, both inside and outside. He'll sometimes double them up. Uh, he'll also, and this is something to keep in mind, he will go to the body very hard with a body kick, especially if his opponent starts, you know, looking to cut, protect his legs. Solid combinations as he finished with that low kick, and we know about Brown's vulnerability to the body, and that's something to keep in mind as well. Now, Brown has good range striking. Volume is almost four strikes landed per minute, which is significant over Hendricks. Hendricks almost even strikes landed per minute versus strikes given up, which is not an exchange rate you want to give, except for the fact Hendricks has that power to make up the difference. Now, Brown has never been knocked out. He has exception, an exceptional chin minus the body issue we just talked about. Hendricks hasn't been either, and he has gone 10 rounds with a very dangerous Robbie Lawler, so keep that in mind as well. Now, Hendricks has that one-punch knockout power. We did see Brown KO Mike Pyle, but it's, he's more death by accumulation. If Brown starts to open up, look for Johnny to take him down and spend prolonged periods of time on top of him. We have seen Brown taken down a lot of late or in, in his matchups. Uh, and Hendricks' cardio, I think it'll be better over three rounds. I don't think that's going to be as big an issue. Look for Hendricks to attack the body, set it up with low kicks, and eventually when Brown starts covering up, look for Johnny to go to the midsection and unload with a, a fight-ending barrage. And my prediction is Johnny Hendricks to defeat Matt Brown by TKO. We move to the co-main event of the evening, and we're in the UFC's women's strawweight division as the champion Carla the Cookie Monster Esparza, 11-2-0, battles the number one ranked contender and challenger, undefeated at 8-0, Joanna Yanjacek. Now, this is the first strawweight title fight, uh, title defense uh, in the history of the promotion, so a pretty big matchup here. Now, it's the third bout for uh, Yan Jacek in the UFC, so certainly a comfort level climbing there. For Carla, this is her second matchup since beating uh, Rose Namajuanas in her first uh, opportunity. Now, keep in mind, Carla was the Invicta champion and was the number one ranked seed heading into the tournament, so certainly, you know, a lot of expectations for her, and so, so far she has met them, winning a pretty big tournament against pretty much the top straw weights in the world, minus a couple. Uh, physically, and Jacek will have a 2-inch reach advantage and a 5-inch height advantage. Now, Esparza, All-American collegiate wrestler, BJJ Brown Belt, so certainly a well-accredited grappler. For Ian Jacek, a multi-time Muay Thai champion at various levels, so you know, basically had that classic grappler versus wrestler matchup. Uh, for Esparza, she will be strongest on the mat, and Joanna, she's going to be strongest on the feet. That's where they, where they personally can compete and be that their best. Now, to keep in mind, though, Esparza is very capable of competing on the feet and being a striker in this fight, where uh, Jen Jacek, she's going to be very hard-pressed to win this matchup if she spends time on the mat. For the most part, she's going to be focused entirely on defense if the fight does hit the ground. Uh, for Esparza, on the uh, with striking, she throws a nice, you know, nice two to three straight punches. And when she fought Rose, she she had great distance management as wrestlers do, and was able to avoid a lot of her strikes, move out of the way. And she was incredibly accurate against Jessica Penny, who's a very dangerous striker in her own right, in landing a lot of strikes and countering Penny when she came forward. Against Rose, anytime Rose kicked, she was able to catch catch the kick and score a takedown that really prevented Rose from really getting that kicking arsenal going uh, for long durations of that that uh, matchup. Esparza likes that power double, really good at driving through. She has excellent timing on her shot as well. On the mat, she'll posture up and attack. She has this really nice technique where she'll keep the knee kind of pot in the midsection of her opponent and she can either, you know, slide it to advanced position. At the very least, it will neutralize her opponent's sub opportunities. She's very active from top position. And that really broke Rose down and got her to eventually give up the submission. For Ian Jacek, she's a world-class striker based in Muay Thai. Very diverse striking attack. She has a nice variety of weapons. Very hard to predict when she is attacking. When she fought Claudia Godella, she dropped her in the first round with an absolutely brutal uppercut. 
and and won a first round. I thought she was on her way to losing in the final seconds. She has good knee strikes in close and very quick hands. She will go to the body and is very effective with that. Now, again, in that fight, fight, because her opponent was looking to take her down, she wasn't throwing a ton of kicks, but she cut some very good angles, and that really made her striking that much more effective. Now, keep in mind, facing somebody like Godella, who's a world-class grappler, that's an excellent experience advantage, or at least experience gained by the challenger coming into this matchup. She's very strong in the clinch. She had a lot of success fending off Claudia, who was looking to take downs, but still, she was taking down several times in that matchup. When she was taking down in the second round, she, you know, she was able to get back up, but she was giving up her back at points, and that was certainly concerning in a fight in, in a fight like this with a fighter who's very good at uh, taking back position. Overall, she was taken down seven times in that matchup, and while she won the striking battles, it was a very close and contestable final uh, how that fight came out. I think you know she took advantage of Claudia getting tired in that fight, and eventually in pursuit of the takedown, that was her key to victory for Godella. You know, she struggles to make weight, and that's why she wasn't on top. And I said, you know, Jan Jacek was able to capitalize on that. I don't think that'll be the case here against uh, Carla Esparza. Esparza is really the first top level wrestler that uh, Jan Jacek has faced. That power double and ability to, to shoot from distance is going to be a significant advantage. Too many takedowns for the champion. Too, too, I'm sorry, too many takedown techniques for the champion, and she's not going to slow down. And I don't like the way Jan Jacek gives up her back when she's trying to get up. And that's a mistake against Esparza, who has four submission wins, all of them coming by rear naked choke. I think her pace will simply be too much for the challenger and my prediction is Carlos Barza to defeat Yuana Jenchechek Jenchechek by submission most likely a rear naked choke and she'll retain her title as a result. We move now to the main event of the evening in the UFC's lightweight division as the champion Anthony Showtime Pettis 18-2-0 battles the number one contender Rafael Dos Anjos with a current record of 23 wins and 7 losses. Now this is Pettis' second title defense and a lot of people we've, it's been well talked about that the champion is not really a champion until he's defended his title once which he accomplished again against uh, Gilbert Melendez. Now, looking at the lineal titles, which is kind of fun in this division, RDA, or sorry, Pettis currently holds the UFC, WEC, and Strikeforce lineal titles, which is something, by my count anyway. Uh, Donald Cerrone, having beaten Eddie Alvarez, does have the Bellator lineal title, so it could be interesting if they pair up again, get everything meshed together. If I'm wrong, please in the comments correct me and show me where I went wrong with that assessment. And Hoffman Dos Anjos has put together an impressive run, but many feel Habib Nurmagomedov is the true number one contender, and you know, he's the only person to actually beat Dos Anjos in his last nine fights, so certainly that's worth keeping in mind as well. For Dos Anjos, he's had an impressive number of wins on route to getting the shot, though. Beating Donald Cerrone, beating Evan Dunham, and beating Nate Diaz are all very impressive. Beating Benson Henderson was an upset that I predicted was pretty darn good as well. But I think the knockout was nice, but winning that fight in a longer bout would have been a little bit more impressive and proved a little bit more about the challenger. It's interesting to note, actually, that Clay Guida was the last man to beat Anthony Pettis, and he also holds a victory, albeit over, via injury, over Rafael Dos Anjos. So very, you know, kind of a kooky stat there. Uh... As far as a guy that's really not in contention anymore, that certainly uh, has wins over prominent fighters. Physically, Pettis will have a two-inch height advantage and a two-inch reach advantage. Uh, accreditation wise, accreditation wise, Taekwondo and kickboxing black belts, BJJ brown belt, and a yellow rope and capoeira. For Dos Anjos, he's a BJJ black belt, and uh, you know he doesn't have a lot of other accreditations, but still, he's a very capable fighter. Win totals for for the Brazilian: eight wins by submission, eleven wins by decision, and just four wins by knockout. He does have uh, not losses by knockout submission and five by decision. For Anthony Pettis, seven wins by knockout, eight wins by submission. He's three and two in decisions, which appears to be his one area of weakness, if you can call it that. Now, both guys have made massive improvements of late, and that's why they're in the position they currently are. Dos Anjos' striking has come leaps and bounds from where it used to be, and to a lesser extent, his wrestling has improved, you know, improved as well. For Anthony Pettis, his submission game has really come out of nowhere and has been quite solid, and uh, his defensive grappling has improved as well. Uh, now, the book on Anthony Pettis, though, the champion, it has been that wrestling and pressure are his downfall. We saw Gill try to employ that, and he had a lot of success, and he carried the pace in the first round and obviously won that uh, opening round with that approach. He scored some takedowns. He forced Pettis to be on the defensive. And, you know, but the thing in that matchup is even though Gill was attacking, when Pettis got a small amount of space or opening, he fired off some ridiculously powerful shots that had Gill backing up. And even though Gill's a warrior and went at him, he just couldn't carry that uh, success through long enough to pick up the victory. Uh, keep in mind here, Pettis still threw a lot of kicks in that fight, you know, to the body, to the head, he showed good footwork, and was still very active despite being put under pressure and getting backed into the cage. We saw him crack with Melendez when he cracked Melendez a couple times when he came forward, and eventually jumped in a small opening for a submission, in a bout that he, you know, was arguably losing, so it just shows how capable he is in fights, you know, to do a lot with just a little bit of an opportunity. For Dos Anjos, 2.3 takedowns at 38%, so that's something to keep in mind as well. 
he has used takedown games in the past. We saw him land a couple takedowns against Cerrone, a couple against Nate Diaz. Uh, so he certainly could go on the offensive there. I don't expect to see Pettis shooting for takedowns, but you never know. He's very, you know, he's a diverse fighter, and it's something he can come out and do and throw Dos Anjos off. You know, can he take Pettis down? Is that a, is that an option? And can he keep him down even more importantly and fend off the you know submissions off his back? You know, we saw him drop. Uh, that's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, if he can't take him down, he's going to have to rely on a strike, which certainly isn't a you know that big of an issue. He dropped Donald Cerrone the right hand. He stopped uh, Benson Henderson. Obviously, with, he has some power. He has some exceptionally hard leg kicks. Good combinations. He's very active. He uses a lot of movement against Nate Diaz. He did an exceptional job of avoiding a lot of Nate's attacks. Nate landing 13 significant strikes of 104 attempted. You know, and that was very very impressive in that stand from that standpoint. But keep in mind. You know, when he fought Nate Diaz, he left a lot of distance between, and I think that's something Anthony Pettis can exploit, as Pettis is his fantastic, you know, looking for openings and, t- ex- you know, taking advantage of them. He's the more diverse striker in this fight. Both guys average close to the same striking output and input. Pettis does a slightly better job of limiting his opponents, and uh, I think he'll get the better on the feet. And we haven't seen Pettis push, though, since, other than the first round against Gill, he hasn't gone more than a round and a half since 2011. So if, you know, if Dos Anjos can get into the latter half of a fight, that could be to his advantage, but keep Keep in mind, you know, he struggled against uh, in a grinding matchup against uh, Evan Dunham, and if he's improved his cardio, that's fantastic. It's going to be difficult for him to go five rounds and keep a pace. It's going to keep Pettis backing up. I think Pettis is simply too quick. He's going to exploit the distance that RDA likes to keep. I think he might land a head kick a la the, uh, the uh, Joe Lozon fight, and my prediction is Anthony Pettis to defeat Rafael Dos Anjos by knockout. So those are my five main card predictions for UFC 185. I'll keep it short because I had a lot to say about those fights and I rambled a little bit. All my preliminary predictions available at kamikazeoverdrive.net. The bet packs are going off and looking you know, like there'll be another winner as I'm really excited about uh, the possibilities with this card. But I want to see people out. I said I opened it up to 25 competitors for the... Uh, the DraftKings, just click on the banner that talks about the Kamikaze Overdrive Tournament and sign up. There's only there's limited 25 spots, winner take all, $10 entry, $225 to the winner, five fighters. It's really a fun way to spend the night uh, competing. There's a variety of other tournaments you can partake in as well if you're interested. Nonetheless, thank you as always for listening. We've got a busy schedule ahead of us and i got to get to research for the prelims, so I'll talk to you soon.